Hello students, welcome to Data Sound Line. My name is Idris Samsuya. We are here to do a revision lesson in history paper two. And our topic of today is the rise of capitalism in Europe. And my dear students, we are going to focus on uh, five subtopics. The transition from feudalism to agrarian revolution. And the second subtopic is the rise of mercantilism. The third is Africa's contribution to the development of capitalism in Europe and North America. The fourth is demographic revolution and scientific revolution. And lastly, we are going to look at the industrial revolution, uh, which has got some faith, first faith and uh, the second faith. My dear students, today we are going to concentrate on one subtopic. And this is the transition from feudalism to agrarian revolution. Transition from feudalism to agrarian revolution. Uh, my dear students, in this start of today, in this lesson of today, my dear students, you have to make sure that you, uh, you achieve the following uh, specific objectives. The first specific objective is analyzing the problem that faced agriculture in Europe under open field system. And the second objective is explaining the reasons why enclosure system was adopted and open field system discarded. And the third is assessing the impact of introduction of enclosure system on agriculture and science and technology in Britain. These, my dear students, are objective. And you have to make sure that at the end of our start of today, you are able to achieve these three objectives which I've just mentioned. My dear students, these are the questions that at the end of our start of today, you have to make sure that you are able to attempt these four questions. Our first question is analyze the problem that faced agriculture in Europe under open field system. And the second question is show how enclosure system solved the problems of agriculture in Britain in 18th century. And the third question is assess the impact of enclosure system on agriculture and science and technology in England. And the fourth question is show the impact of agricultural revolution to the development of capitalism in Europe. My dear students, these are our four questions. And at the end of our lesson of today, you have to make sure that you are able to attempt these questions. So uh, at a time when we're still going on with our lesson, please try your best to also find some answers uh, in the lessons uh, that I'm going to give it to you very soon. My dear students, Let's now look, let, uh, let's now go to the rise of capitalism in Europe. And uh, as, as I said, we are going to concentrate on the transition uh, from feudalism to agrarian revolution. Let's first look what is feudalism. Feudalism, my dear students, is a third, is a third mode of production, a third mode of production. And according to uh, Karl Marx, this is the second exploitative mode of production. Second exploitative mode of production. Of course, you know that the first exploitative mode of production uh, is slavery, and this is the second exploitative mode of production. And this feudalism, it is characterized by private ownership of major means of production. Private ownership of major means of production major means of production. So there is a private ownership of major means of production. And the most important major means of production, my dear students, that you are talking about here is land. Land is the major means of production. And also there is existence of two classes. Existence of two classes. What are those classes, my dear students? We have got two classes. The first class is the class of landlord the class of landlord. And the second class is the class of landless people, or sometimes we call them slaves. These are the two classes which exist in this system of feudalism. But also, uh, people are exploited in this system of feudalism through rent, and we have three forms of rent. There is, uh, rent is of three kinds. We have got renting, uh, renting, renting labor, which of course was the first to be introduced, and then followed by the rent uh, no, rent in kind. And finally, at the time when feudalism was on the verge of collapsing, they came to introduce rent, rent in money. So this is the way, uh, you know, this is the way people are exploited through this feudal system. And this is started, of course, in Europe during the 9th century and went on until the 15th century. So my dear students, this is exactly what we can say regarding uh, the 
uh, you know, regarding feudalism. Uh, my dear students, uh, let's now look at capitalism, because we are talking about the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Though our subtopic has used the word, the transition from uh, feudalism to agrarian revolution. Remember, agrarian revolution is one among the factors for the rise of capitalism. So in short here, we are speaking about the transition from feudalism uh, to capitalism. So let's look about capitalism. Capitalism is a social, economic, but also political system, social, economic, and political system, which is characterized by private ownership of major means of production. So saying private ownership of major means of production, my dear students, you might not see difference between what I said earlier when I was defining feudalism, that there is also private ownership of major means of production. But here we are talking about the private ownership of major means of production, whereby the major means of production are owned by very, very few people. So the more the development of capitalism, the more few people own the major means of production. And also there is exploitative, uh, you know, there is exploitation of man by man. And the people who are exploited the most here are workers. Workers are exploited to the maximum. Workers here are exploited to the maximum by being paid low wages, being forced to work for long hours, but most important, they are working and living in a very poor conditions. This is the way workers are exploited. So this is the system of capitalism. System of capitalism, it has many names. Sometimes they call it a free market economy, a free market economy. And sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes it can be also called a liberal economy. And so on, I, I mean, and so on and so forth. And it is called the free market economy as opposed to what we call a command economy. A command economy. A command economy, my dear students, this is socialism. This is socialism. This is socialism. So this is what we can say regarding uh, capitalism. My dear students, let's very quickly look at the characteristic of uh, capitalism. What characterizes capitalism? The first characteristic of capitalism as I said earlier, it is a free market economy. That means uh, people are allowed to, 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 I mean, people are allowed to conduct economic activity freely. There is very less government interference. In fact, uh, you know, in fact, Adam Smith, one of the very old economists, uh, you know, once he came with what he called a laissez-faire, a laissez-faire, laissez-faire. Uh, this, of course, is a French word which means put your hands off. That means the government should not put her hands to the private, uh, you know, to the, I mean, to the private properties. That's what it meant, put your hands off. And this is what they meant by free market economy. That means to allow private individuals to operate the economy. This is what it means by free market economy. But the second characteristic, my dear students, uh, is what was described as private ownership of major means of production. The major means of production are owned by private people. Here we are talking of major means of production like land, industries, bank, and all other things which are helping, you know, I mean, which are producing, they are owned by individuals, they are owned by private people. So this is the second characteristic. The third, my dear students, is that there is what we call commoditization of labor. Labor in, uh, you know, labor under capitalism, they are regarded as commodity. And remember, when we talk of commodity, my dear students, we are speaking of something which can be traded in the market, something which has got its price. So laborers also have got their price, and the price of labor is wage. This is what uh, uh, Karl Marx has described, that labor, which of course, you know, they are human beings, they have been reduced to become just just like any other commodity with the price in the market. So there is what we call commoditization of labor. Another characteristic is there is existence of two classes. I said this earlier, the class of workers and the class of capitalists. The class of workers, remember I said, is exploiting the class, uh, so sorry, the class of capitalists is exploiting the class of workers. And this is another characteristic. But also, as I said, also there is exploitation of man by man. So far, you know who exploit who. Another thing is there is antagonistic relations. The relations between the capitalists and the workers is not good. Why? Because as I said earlier, they are exploiting each other. They are exploiting each other. Uh, the capitalists are exploiting the workers. So there is no way the workers can be in a good term with the capitalists. Another thing is uh, there is a commodity production. Production is going on. There is production in agriculture and so on, but emphasis is put in commodity production, production of commodities. That means industrial production. They concentrate more in the industries. My dear students, the transition, let's now look about the transition from feudalism to 
uh, you know, from feudalism to agrarian revolution. The transition from feudalism to agrarian revolution, as I, you know, as I said earlier, you know, this was in fact characterized, or it led to the, I mean, characterized by the rise of mercantilism. And European feudalism was also known as open field system. Open field system. So here we get one thing, my dear students. When we talk of feudalism, here we are talking about open field system. Open field system, which of course was dominant in Europe, as I said, from 9th century to the 15th century. But when we talk of agrarian revolution, my dear students, we'll always be referring to enclosure system. Why enclosure system? Because one among the very important preconditions for the agrarian revolution, which took place in Britain, it was the enclosure system. That means uh, fencing the land for undertaking a large scale agricultural production. That's what it means by enclosure system. So we have got two things, my dear students. We have got open field system and we have got enclosure system. So that's why then we're going to speak about the uh, we are going to speak about the transition from open field system to enclosure system that means the transition from feudalism to agrarian uh, revolution my dear students let's now look about the open field system open field system is a medieval system of farming in england uh, which land was divided into three strips land was divided into three strips that means if this is land then it has to be divided into three strips one two three and in this three strip in these three strips then two Oh, I mean, only two strips were to be put in production, and one has to be rested. One has to be rested. And, and why were they resting one piece? They were resting that one piece because they said, Landy is always getting exhausted. So they want to rest it so that it can become fertile and be used another after another, you know, after another year. So this is what they did in England. This is what they did in England. And this was called open field system because land was built into a very small pieces, a very small pieces, which were called tenure. So, uh, so this is exactly why it was called the open field system. And in fact, the word open field system was used as opposed to a word enclosure system. That means later they came to put a fence to the land. Land was enclosed. But earlier, uh, you know, earlier, uh, it was very open. One field was planted in the fall, another was planted in the spring, and the third field has to remain uncultivated. It has to remain uncultivated. And this method was only good for, it helped to prevent, uh, to preserve, it helped to, uh, to, to prevent soil exhaustion through crop rotation. But it was bad because production was always low as long as you're putting to rest one third, you know, you're putting to rest just, uh, uh, you know, one third of the land each year. So this is what we can say, uh, my dear students. Let's now look at the problem that face agriculture in Europe under open field system. Under this open field system, what were the problems that faced agriculture in Europe? My dear students, the first problem that agriculture in Europe faced under this open field system is that production, production was very low as much as most of the land was to be rested. Of course, we have seen it here, my dear students, that if, you know, if this is the land and this piece of land has to be put in production, but then instead you are resting just one third of the land, only one third of the land is to be rested and two thirds of the land has to be put in production. It's obvious that under this system, production is not going to be high because an arable land, which was supposed to be used for production in agriculture, that piece of land is rested. So production is going to be low. Not only that, but also production was low because of some other reasons, including uh, other things which I can see later, uh, poor agricultural methods which were used, uh, you know, they're also using bad crop rotation and so on. But for now, let's concentrate on this one aspect, that agriculture was low because uh, most of the land has to be rested, as we have seen. That one third of the land has to be rested and only two thirds of the land was to be put in production. So that has to lead to poor agricultural production. Another thing is open field system was discouraging the application of science and technology was discouraging the application of science and technology. Why do we say it, it discouraged the application of science and technology? My dear students, we have said, imagine a piece of land like this one, which of course we said, under open field system, land was to be divided into a very small pieces, as you can see, very small pieces. So I'm asking you a question, my dear students, just look for yourself. Can you apply a tractor? Can you apply a tractor in a very small piece of land like this one? Oh, because you don't know how large it is, let's take the example of your school. Imagine that you have got a piece of land which is as large, as small as your class. 
as small as your class. And that can be called a plot of somebody, a plot of somebody. So my question is, can you apply a tractor in that piece of land? Can you apply planter in that piece of land? Can you apply combined harvest in that piece of land? The answer is no. You cannot apply any machine in that piece of land. So you can see, because of that system of agriculture of open field, it was totally discouraging the application of science and technology. Or for instance, the pieces like this one, you want to introduce irrigation agriculture. How can you bring water to your farm? That means you'll have to pass through many people's farm. And they will not agree because their pieces of land are very small. So if you put, if you, if you pass water through their farms, it's obvious that you are going to destroy their farms. So totally this system was discouraging the development of science and technology. It discouraged development of science and technology. Another point, my dear students, is that this system was totally discouraging the development of productive forces. As we said earlier, it discouraged the development of productive forces. Remember, development of productive forces was always encouraged by the increasing demand of such productive forces. So if the kind of system of agriculture is like this one, it's obvious people will not demand the advanced productive forces. People will not demand the tractors, will not demand the combined harvesters, the planters, and so on. What people demand is just some hand hole, just some poor tools of production which can be used in this piece of land. So what I'm trying to say here is, uh, uh, you know, the most, the most reliable tools to be used in this type of agriculture, they were hand haul, uh, you know, hand haul, plow, and not more than a plow. That's what they could use. So you can see it was, it was totally discouraging the development of productive forces. And so production, because first of all, production was only undertaken at a small scale, as we have said earlier, and they were producing for consumption and not for exchange. So you can see this also is one of the problems which faced agriculture in Europe uh, at that time. My dear students, another problem which faced agriculture in Europe at that time, it was, uh, uh, you know, it was crop rotation which was applied was very, very poor. It was not good. It was not good to guarantee high soil utility. You are applying crop rotation. Remember, crop rotation is when you have your farm, is when you have your farm, my dear students, and in that farm that you have, you can divide it into three portions. And today you can grow some crops here, let's say crop A, tomorrow you grow some crop B, and the other day another crop is growing here. And those crops are alternating. You are changing them regarding the types of crops. For instance, we know there are some crops which are always so good for fertilizing the soils. We are no, they, are no, uh, they are known as the, uh, you know, as the fertility generating crops. And those have to be alternated with other crops which are not. But unfortunately, the kind of system they were using it was not good. Sometimes they can plant the crops which are all soil consuming and they're exchanging. So that's obvious that some crops could not produce nitrogen and that has to cause a lot of problems. So with this, my dear students, you can see crop rotation applied, as I said, was not good and it was totally discouraging uh, the production. My dear students, you can look at this. This is what I was trying to say. This is the kind of crop rotation which was used during that time. Shifting field two to three, Crop rotation increased food production, kept soil fertility uh, that could grow more. And one field planted in the fall, grain harvested in the summer, second field in the spring with grain and veggies and so on and so forth. So you can see this is the way they are using. Unfortunately, as I said, the kind of rotation they were applying, it was not good and it could not guarantee them a good, uh, you know, a good result. My dear students, another problem which faced English agriculture, uh, uh, sorry, another problem which faced agriculture in Europe, uh, it is that agriculture in Europe under this system was lacking capital. They were lacking capital. They didn't have capital. You know what capital means? Capital is very important if one wants to expand your agriculture because with capital, you can be able to buy labor. With capital, you can be able to buy implement. With capital, of course, you can be able to buy uh, land. So one of the problems which faced agriculture in Europe at that time was lack of capital. They didn't have enough money to change that agriculture. So that is why agriculture at that time has to remain backward. It has to remain backward because of what I've said. So 
If at all there were some productive forces, then no one could buy because they didn't have money to buy those productive forces. So what did they do? They continue to rely on the use of faith and uh, the use of faith. And the other people continue to remain peasant, producing at a very small scale because of lack of capital. So that is another very important problem which faced the, uh, which faced the agriculture sector in Europe uh, under open field system. Uh, another thing, my dear students, is that uh, there was also the problem of landy fragmentation, landy, uh, landy fragmentation, fragmentation of land, fragmentation of land. What do we mean by land fragmentation? It means, as I said earlier, under open field system, land was to be divided into what they call the tenure. Tenure, it means the small pieces. It means the small pieces of land, very small pieces of land. So because of these very small pieces of land, as I said earlier, you cannot hear, my dear students, apply any productive forces which is advanced. You cannot apply tractor under these pieces of land. You cannot apply combined harvester either. You cannot apply planter or even weeding machine and so on. So for that case, as you can see, my dear students, there were some problems be, uh, which, uh, you know, I mean, there were some problems in English, uh, in Europe agriculture, which was caused by problem of land fragmentation. Land was divided into small pieces and that has to become an obstacle. And also you can see, under these small pieces of land, for instance, some people were practicing, uh, they were keeping animals and they were keeping their animals outdoors. That means they have to take their animals to the pastures every day and always they were passing through other people's farm. So this has not only created the problem of low production and so on, but it also led to the rising of a lot of conflict between people. Because some people can claim that your animals have eaten my crops and so on. This, my dear students, is what we experience in some parts of Tanzania, for instance. In Kilosa, we used to have the fighting between the pastoralists and the farmers. And why? Because the pastoralists have taken their, uh, their animals, you know, their, their cattles to, the, uh, to other people's farm. And that has to cause a lot of conflict. And that's also has been experienced in Europe at that time. So, my dear students, this is the problem that faced agriculture in Europe under open field system. Another problem, my dear students, is political instability. During that time, there was political instability. What do we mean by political instability? That means politically, some European countries were not stable. They were not stable. There were some wars. There were some conflict going on, particularly between the landlord particularly between the landlords vis-a-vis -vis the safe and the peasant. The landlord vis-a-vis -vis the safe and peasant, they were always quarreling, they were always fighting. A good example, my dear students, is in England, where in uh, 1453, in England, uh, there was a war between the safe and peasants against the landlord. The safe and peasants joined together to fight against the landlord. So, my dear students, under a war situation, we don't, uh, we don't think people will concentrate in production. Rather, people will have to, uh, to take some measures, at least to, to save their life, and so on. So, this is what was going on uh, in Europe. So, this also is another very important obstacle to development of agriculture in Europe under open field system. My dear students, as you can see, this is the disadvantage of that open field system, as you can see. And these are the farms. These are the farms. And these are the, you know, you know, uh, you know and as you can see, in this farm, we have got some problems which are listed here, you see. Uh, people have to walk over the strip to reach their own. That means if, for instance, you are here, you just want to go to your strip, you just want to go to your farm, you'll have to walk to other people's farm, you see. You'll have to walk over other people's farm. So walking over other people's farm, what do you think is going to cause here? There's going to be some trouble. There's going to be some conflict. You see? So that is another thing. But also, if you want to bring some waters to your farm, that means you'll have to pass the waters through other people's farm. Also, animals, as you can see, animals also sometimes could be brought and eat other people's crops and so on. So you can see the situation, therefore, as I said earlier, uh, has provided a very great obstacle to development of agriculture in Europe. This is what we can say, uh, my dear students, regarding uh, the problem that faced agriculture in Europe. My dear students, let's now move to another very important aspect, and this is the enclosure system. What is enclosure system? Enclosure system, according to uh, Karl Marx, enclosure system can be 
explained as the process of divorcing the producers from their means of production. Divorcing the producers from their means of production. What are those producers in which Marx was referring to? Marx was referring to the peasant and safes. The peasant and safes were divorced from their means of production. And, and that land was taken by the capitalists, the people's capital, who established a large scale commercial agriculture. A large scale commercial agriculture. This is what Marx, you know, this is what Marx has defined as the enclosure system. But after introduction of that enclosure system, the capitalists, in fact, they took the land, which formerly belonged to the landlord, the safe, the landlord and peasant, and they put a fence to that land. That's why the process is called enclosure system. That means they were enclosing the land which was once open. So they are putting the fence to the land. And of course, I said, after putting the fence to the land, they introduced what we call a large scale agricultural production. Large scale agricultural production. But my dear students, when this, when this system was introduced, they first started with uh, the process of sheep rearing. They were keeping sheep. And that's why they took very large amount of land for keeping sheep. But later, they also started to produce different kinds of crops including uh, raw materials and so on. Originally, enclosure system started in 12th century. It is started in 12th century. And why 12th century? It is started in 12th century after the increasing demand for wool from France and Belgium. There was increasing demand for wool from France and Belgium. Remember, my dear students, wool, before introduction of cotton in Europe, was used as a very important raw material for production of cloth. And there was inc increasing demand for wool in Belgium and France. That people were producing clothes in Belgium, they needed much more wool than before. So, uh, in, uh, you know, so for that case, that encouraged people in Britain who were good for keeping sheep, who were good for sheep rearing, to increase the amount of sheep which were kept. So for that case, they needed large land to expand their, uh, you know, to expand their farms, their ranch. So for that case, they introduced the enclosure system. So that is the way you can trace enclosure system. However, enclosure system, uh, it is officially came into, uh, to, to, to be known to many people in the 15th century. My dear students, this is the way enclosure system is. Remember earlier we spoke about land being divided into very small pieces, you see? But now as you can see, all this is the land of somebody. You can see the land strip. You can see the land, uh, you know, the land, uh, you, sorry, you can see the red strip which passes here. This is now the farm of one person. This is the farm of one person. And this is the farm of, here they are keeping animals. Here they are producing barley. And here they are producing wheat. And this is the, you know, this is the house of some people and so on. So you can see there was a transformation from people using those small pieces of farms to a time when now people use the very large farms. So this is the way Europe has been changed because of introduction of uh, enclosure system. Uh, my dear students, let's now look at the reasons for adapting enclosure system and, disca and discouraging open field system. Why enclosure system was adopted? The first reason, of course, we have mentioned is because of the increasing demand for wool, uh, you know, in Belgium and France, which resulted from the expansion of market of clothes in France and Belgium. And because of that, then people in Britain who were producing, uh, who were producing wool, they have to increase production. And they came with the idea of taking the land and putting a fence for undertaking a large scale sheep rearing. So that led to the beginning of enclosure system. Uh, my dear students, the second point is emergence of petty capitalists with capital. Remember I said earlier, one of the problems which characterize English agriculture, agriculture in Europe in general, so to say, uh, it was the uh, lack of capital. But because of mercantilism, because of long distance trading, uh, that some people were participating in, then it contributed to the emergence of some petty capitalists, some petty capitalists with capital. Some people got money, and those people, they started to think of coming to invest in agriculture. And so they came to buy land, land which, will be, uh, land which used to belong to the, uh, you know, to, the, to the landlords. They bought a very large amount of land and they put a fence for establishment of large-scale agricultural production. So imagine so petty capitalists with capital, therefore, is one of the very important reasons for 
uh, uh, you know, for the image, uh, you know, for the rise of enclosure system. And in fact, that has discouraged the open field system. And that capital, remember, was very useful for buying workers, buying machine, buying raw materials and so on, even buying land itself. So it's because of that that, uh, uh, you know, that enclosure system was adopted. Another reasons for the adoption of enclosure system and discouraging open field system uh, was the collapse of feudal political system and the monasteries, the collapse of feudal political system and monasteries. Remember, feudalism had always been insisting the existence of the old system because the feudal lords, the landlords were benefited by that system. And that, you know, that feudal system was not only economic system, but it was also political system, and it was supported by church. That's why we are speaking of the collapse of feudal political system and the monasteries, and the monasteries. And monasteries, of course, refer to a building usually surrounded with grounds in which the churchmen live and work apart from the rest of the society. And King Henry, of course, of course, that you know that uh, King Henry He's the one who abolished that monasteries in England, for instance, right? And it all happens after he quarreled Roman, Roman Catholic Church uh, because Roman Catholic Church rejected uh, King, Hen to, uh, King Henry to divorce his wife Catherine uh, after Cath Catherine has failed to give him, uh, you know, a son for a quite a long time. But Roman Catholic, uh, uh, you know, but Pope rejected the idea of uh, King Henry divorcing his wife. And King Henry decided to withdraw his, uh, himself and his people from the Roman Catholic Church and establish the Church of England. And because of that, the Anglican Church, because of that, uh, then he also went far and abolished the monasteries. By abolishing monasteries, then it led to the collapse of feudalism because, uh, because monasteries and feudal systems, they were very intact. They were very close to each other. So that also led to the, uh, you know, to the... Uh, adoption of enclosure system. In fact, this went on that even their properties, the properties of the landlords were confiscated and they were sold very cheap to the capitalists. And why? Because they said that, uh, they, uh, you know, I mean, they said that the feudal lords, the feudal lords have become economically mismanaged and politically corrupt. So they were economically mismanaged and politically corrupt. So it means their properties have to be confiscated. And as I said, they were sold very cheap to the capitalists. So that has contributed to the uh, collapse of feudalism and the monasteries, but it gave away to the, uh, to the rise of enclosure system. My dear students, this is the monasteries, as you can say, and this is the ruin of Gaston Barry Abbey, which was dissolved in 1539, following the execution of Abbott. So you can see this is the, uh, you know, this is the ruin of the monasteries. And there were so many monasteries in Europe, particularly in England, as you can see. So all of these were demolished. All of these were, uh, you know, they were dissolved. And this explains how changes then came about. Another very important reason for adopting a closure system and discouraging open field system in Europe, my dear students, was about development of science and technology, which helped to improve the productive forces. My dear students, we are talking about improvement of productive forces. Improvement of productive forces. But this was the result of development of science and technology. For instance, because of this improvement of productive forces, my dear students, and resulted from development of science and technology, there was the invention of production equipment like tractors. Uh, there was, in, uh, you, know, uh, you know, tractors. There was combined harvesters. There was planter. There was also weeding machine and so on. So, uh, you know, so different kind of discoveries, different kind of invention was made in agriculture, uh, in agriculture. And remember, they started to introduce tractors. But when you have introduced tractors, you can cultivate a very large size uh, amount of land. After, during the planting, you'll find some problems that you can't plant by using hand, uh, you know, and finish it. So you'll have to think and think. And they came up with the planting machine. After that, of course, they introduced some weeding machine. Later, they come up with the combined harvesters, the machine for harvesting. So that has contributed to the improvement of agriculture. And of course, as I said, 
because of development practice forces, then they have to adopt enclosure system. Because the enclosure system, as we said, a very large, um, a, a very large amount of land is taken and owned by one or two, pe you know, by one person. And that person, because of a very little machine, he was able to, or she was able to use that pieces of land to. Uh, to put it into production by using the advanced tools of production. That is not all, but also we can speak of science. In science, for instance, we know there is the introduction of insecticide and pesticide, the introduction of fertilizers and so on. So all those things has contributed to ad adoption of enclosure system. And in fact, it discouraged open field system because under this, no one could concentrate, no one could uh, engage in open field system as long as people are getting a lot of profit. Uh, another point, another point, my dear students, is the increase in population is another factor for enclosure system. Population has increased. And when population increase, my dear students, it means the demand for food also increase. So people have to change. Instead of producing at a small scale, they'll have to think of producing at a large scale. My dear students, you remember uh, the theory which was given out by one of the English economists called Robert uh, R.T. Malthus. Toma Robert Thomas Mal Malthus. Robert Thomas Malthus. This is Maltesian theory of population. In fact, looking at the situation then, he was saying that population is increasing very fast, but production of food is increasing very slow. So probably people are going to die because of famine. But no, it wasn't that way. Because of increasing population, people were forced to shift. Uh, instead of continuing with that open field system, which was leading to a very low production, people, in fact, change and start to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, 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 em, uh, to embrace enclosure system, which allowed a large scale production. Remember, enclosure system uh, is the, uh, I mean, land is taken and fenced for undertaking a large scale commercial agricultural production. So you can see increasing population, therefore, is one of the reasons which forced people to produce more, which forced the people to, uh, to, to, to use science and technology, which forced the people not to rest one third of the land. They have to put all the land in production. My dear students, another thing is the expansion of town and urban centers. The expansion of town and urban centers also have contributed to increasing demand for food. People who are living in the urban, you know, they're not producing. Let's take, for example, in England, people who live in London, people who live in Birmingham, people who live in Coventry, people who live in Liverpool, Manchester, those people, they're not producing because they live in the urban centers. They live in the places uh, where they cannot produce. So for that case, they are depending on food. They are depending on food to be supplied uh, you know, from people who are living in the rural area. But then, if people in the rural area are still using that poor methods of agriculture, they are still using open field system, it's obvious they cannot and they will never be able to fulfill the demands for food of urban people. So for that case, system has to be changed. Instead of producing by using open field system, they have to adopt enclosure system so that they can be able to fulfill the urban, uh, you know, urban food demands. My dear students, after we have looked at uh, the reasons for adopting enclosure system and discouraging open field system, let's now go to another thing, and this is the impact of introduction of enclosure system on development of agriculture and science and technology. Uh, the first impact is that it enhances application of science and technology. My dear students have said it enhances the application of science and technology. That if you have the piece of land which is so big like this one, you can be able to apply science and technology. You have got, let's say, 100 acres, five, you know, 100 acres, or even five acres plus, it, you can apply science and technology. You can apply tractor here. You can apply planter. You can apply combined harvester. But what, for instance, if you have a piece of land like this one, but it's divided into small strip, as we said earlier, you cannot apply tractor here. So for that case, by having, you know, by having this enclosure system, then it allowed, it allowed the application of science and technology. And so successful would be able to bring about the agrarian revolution. Shall come to see agrarian revolution later, you see? But it, it, it succeeded to bring agrarian uh, revolution. Another thing is it helped to transform English agriculture. English agriculture, or rather you can say, yeah, English agriculture was transformed from a uh, uh, production for use, which of course was typical characteristic of feudalism to production for exchange, which you know is the characteristic of uh, capitalism. That the production for use, for use, 
to for exchange for use is a characteristic of uh, you know feudalism and for exchange is a typical characteristic of uh, capitalism. So there was such kind of transformation and in fact it, it helped what we call the qualitative and the quantitative improvement of agricultural production. And so this is exactly the contribution of uh, enclosure system to development of agriculture uh, on one hand and science and technology on the other. My dear students, another contribution is it is stimulated development of agricultural Industries. Remember, there are some agricultural related industries. There are some industries which were established purposely to produce, so purposely to produce some agriculture implement. And in fact, if there were no development in agriculture, if there were no enclosure system, those industries would, would have never been established or rather would have never been developed. So they develop because there is the market of what they are producing. For instance, let's look, the industries that produce tractors, industries that produce combined harvesters, pl produce planters, those existence of those industries depend on the development of agriculture sector. So you can see enclosure system has contributed to development of such industries. You can also speak of the chemical, ag agrochemical industries, industries which produce insecticide and pesticide, industries uh, which produce uh, you know, industrial fertilizers, they were able to develop because at least they have a market. And what is their market? Their market was uh, in the enclosed land. People who established the enclosure system, they were buying those equipment, those fertilizers and so on. So those industries were able to develop. Another, uh, you know, another impact of enclosure system to development of agriculture was it led to decrease of price of food and expansion of market of food. The price of food decreased. The price of food decreased, but then look, look how this one led to the, uh, you know, how this one led to the development of science and technology or development of industries. When the price of food decreases, it means people can spend very small amount of money to buy food, and the remaining amount of money can be spent to buy industrial goods. So the more, you know, the moment you buy industrial goods, you are becoming a market for that particular industry. And if you're a market, remember, you're contributing for development of such industry. Remember, we'll see it later. One among the factors for industrialization is the expansion of market. And the market is not the number of people. The market is the people who have got ability to buy. That's what we call the market. So people have ability to buy. The purchasing power of the people have to increase because they were spending little amount of money to buy food and the rest of the money was used to buy, uh, you know, was used to buy industrial goods. Another thing is enclosure system has provided a working force. Remember, we are talking of the millions of people who were divorced from their, uh, you know, from their means of production, as Marx has said. People are divorced from their land. Ask yourself a question. After those people have been divorced, where had they gone? They went to town. And what did they do after they arrived in town? They became workers. They became workers working in the industry. So you can see, after going to town, they were working in the industries as cheap labor. And those people, by working the industries, they contributed for development of industries. Because remember, the industries could not operate if there were no people to work. And especially at that time, when technology was still very low, and in fact, they were so highly depending on labor. The industries were labor intensive. So for that case, the millions of people who were divorced from their land, they went to town and in fact became labor. But also, you know, uh, you know not only that, but you can see, even the industrial revolution in Britain has started from the guild system. People who went to town, they established their guild. They, they, you know, I mean, they established their workshop and the workshop became guild. And those guilds later were converted to become factories after being taken by, uh, you know, people with money and so on. Another thing is enclosure system has, in, has contributed to the collapse of minorial system. That means it contributed to the collapse of feudalism. Of course, you know about this. There is no need to talk of detail about this. So my dear students, that is the contribution of uh, enclosure system uh, on agriculture and development, uh, you know, and science and technology in, in, you know, in Britain. Let's now go to uh, agrarian revolution. What is this uh, ag agrarian revolution? Agrarian revolution simply means the rapid change, the rapid change in the field of agriculture, uh, which is characterized by application of science and technology for qualitative and quantitative improvement of agricultural production. My dear students, here we have got several things to talk of. We have got the rapid change. A word rapid change represents revolution. And also we have got 
uh, uh, you know, that change in field of agriculture characterized by application of science and application of science and technology. But for what? For qualitative and quantitative improvement of agriculture production. The improvement in quality and quantity, my dear students, is what we call agrarian revolution. So, of course, the first country in the world to develop in agriculture was Holland and, you know, Holland and France. But, of course, they, were, they, they could not change the agriculture the way the British came to change the, theirs. So, this is what we can say uh, regarding agrarian revolution. My dear students, this is how agrarian revolution started. This is the early time of agrarian revolution, that people were using animals uh, to cultivate their farms. Uh, you know, also, uh, you know, this is plowing, you know, weeding, for instance, they are spreading some chemicals. Uh, these are the very small, simple machines and so on. So this is the way agrarian revolution has started, particularly in England. My dear students, we are using, we are referring to England because it was the first country to develop in agrarian revolution, as we're also going to see uh, England in the Industrial Revolution. So let's look at the factor for agrarian revolution. The first factor is enclosure system. Enclosure system, of course, we have said already about it. The second factor is the use of fertilizers in manure. People are using fertilizers and manure. And this, of course, we are very has played a vital role in, uh, to the agrarian revolution by improving agriculture production. And remember, if people were resting land, at least to make it fertile, now they do, they do not have to put land to rest because now they can use that land for production, all of the land. Also, we've got the introduction of nitrogen crops, such as beans, potatoes, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Remember, nitrogen makes 75% of our atmosphere and it's a key component to the plant growth. But then by introducing those nitrogen crops, like green plants and so on, potatoes, you know, and so on, soil was able to be fertilized. There is this issue of selective breed of livestock. People are selecting the breed of livestock. That means you have to mate your cattle, you have to mate your cattle with a good breed, and that would increase milk, heights, and skins, and so on. Another thing is uh, establishment of drainage system. People have introduced irrigation schemes. So if you know, uh, you, I mean, so if agriculture was seasonal, then it was changed to become unseasonal because people have to produce throughout the year. You don't have to wait for the rains. This is another very important thing. Also, there is the use of chemical insecticide and pesticide. People are using insecticide and pesticide to their crops to kill insects and to kill pests. So that also helped a lot to increase uh, production. Uh, there is also improvement to productive forces. Of course, we have said people are using tractors, they are using planters and different kinds of machines. And in fact, uh, before 1750, farming was done by hands with horses pulling plow uh, or carts. But thereafter, there were the use of machine. Also, there was introduction of new crops. Some new crops like potatoes, for instance, you know, was introduced from North America. And this has contributed much to the uh, improvement of agriculture in England. Uh, my dear students, those were the reasons for agrarian revolution. Let us now look at the contribution of agrarian revolution to the rise of capitalism. The first contribution is it put the concentration, it, uh, the, concentr uh, the concentration of holding of lands was put in the hands of few people. That means land was put in the hands of few people. Remember, one of the characteristics of capitalism is that the major means of production are put in the hands of few people. So, because of this uh, grand revolution, land which used to belong to the landlord, to the safe and the peasant, it was put in the hand of very few people. So that is the first contribution of a grand revolution to the, uh, to, you know, to the rise of capitalism. Another thing is it, it, it helped to transform English agriculture from production for use, which characterizes feudal production, to production for exchange, which is, of course, one of the characteristics of capitalism. Uh, of course, as you can see, in capitalism, production is conducted for use. So, sorry, under feudalism, production is conducted for use. But in capitalism, production is always for exchange. So agriculture was transformed. People were producing for commercial purpose. Another thing is a great revolution has developed other industries, related industries. Of course, we have said the more agriculture develop, the more industries which produce the agriculture implement also have to develop. Another thing is a grand revolution has necessitated the use of machine in agriculture sector, which made it profitable. So by being profitable, many people came to join agriculture sector. And agriculture sector became one of the places where a lot of people came to invest their capital. 
Another thing, my dear students, is a great evolution has ensured the cost and supply of food to both rural and urban. Of course, we have said, as the price of food decreases, then purchasing power of the people in the rural and urban population increased, and the survival of the urban, you know, urban working class was guaranteed. Remember, if there were no food in the urban, people who work in the urban would have to go back to the rural area. And if they go back to the rural area, what do you think will be the fate of the industries which are established in the urban areas? So thanks to a grand revolution that they were able to produce enough food which then has helped a lot to uh, give people of the urban, you know, people of the urban areas enough food to eat. Another thing is a grand revolution has stimulated both internal and external trade and of course the interrelations between the rural and urban. Uh, this is also uh, what we have to say. We have come to the end of our lesson of today. Let us just a break and we'll be back for the questions. Welcome back, my students. Uh, my dear students, remember, in the beginning of our lesson of today, I gave you some questions. And this is one among the questions that I gave you. Our first question, my dear students, is analyze the problem that faced agriculture in Europe and the open field system. After what we have gone through, my dear students, this question is becoming extremely simple. It's very simple because of the fact that now you know the problem that faced agriculture in Europe and the open field system. First of all, in this question, my dear students, you'll have to, to, to analyze. To analyze, my dear students, uh, it means, uh, you, know, uh, you know, to give an analysis. It means to, uh, you know, to explain things in detail. No, no, I mean, not just to mention or to explain. You'll have to explain things in detail. You'll have to sort out things. So this is the question that I gave you. So problems that face agriculture in Europe and the open field system, of course you know them. The first, for instance, we spoke about the, uh, you know, we said that the agriculture system in Europe at that time, it was lacking capital. There were no capital. So even if, uh, you know, even if probably some people wanted, let's say, to buy some machine, even if people maybe some, uh, I mean, even if some people wanted, let's say, to, uh, you know, to buy some land, but the question is, where would they get some money? There was no money to buy land. There was no money to buy machine. There was no money to employ workers either. So for that case, you can see that was the problem. That was the problem. And of course, you see that this problem came to be solved after the emergence of some people uh, with capital. But also, my dear students, we spoke about another problem. And of course, we said there were poor crop rotation, poor crop rotation. People, of course, had the idea of crop rotation. But the kind of crop rotation uh, they were using, we said it was not good. We said it was not good. It was not good for the reason that you alternate crops which are, I mean, you, you alternate crops in your farm of the same type. The crops which does not generate soil fertility, but they alternated in your farms. So that is also another very important problem which faced the agriculture in Europe at that time. There is also another thing we said, production was very low. Production was very low. And production was very low because we said one third of the land has to be rested and only two thirds of the land was to be put in production, let alone some other problems uh, like, those, uh, like those other problems we have said. So all these things, therefore, have to contribute to the uh, poor agriculture production. And that's another problem which faced the agriculture system in, uh, you know, I mean, I mean in Europe. Also, we mention other things like uh, political instability. You cannot go out for production in a situation where there is war everywhere, where people are fighting. So sometimes people have to, you know, people have to either hide themselves inside their houses or they have to produce very close to their home. You can't go far for production. You have to produce very close to your home because you fear for your life. If you go out very far and then, may, I mean, maybe you're exposing yourself to the danger of being killed. So for that case, uh, you know, for that case, uh, people have to hide the, uh, people have to remain at home instead of going out for production. That's another problem which faced the English agriculture. But also you can see some others, as we have said, my dear students, uh, that there were these monasteries, you know, and, and so on, that even those landlords themselves, they were obstacles because they always preferred the sustenance of that political system, that economic system, as well as they were benefited by that, uh, that kind of economic system. So this, I mean, this question, of course, you can attempt it. 
together with some other points that you can also add regarding to what we have uh, discussed. So this question, my dear students, as you can see, as I said, is very simple and you can answer it. So the second question is show how enclosure system solved the problem of agriculture in Britain. How enclosure system solved the problem of agriculture in Britain. My dear students, as we said earlier, when you find this, this issue enclosure system, you'll have also some time to consider it as agrarian revolution. There is a very minor difference between enclosure system and agrarian revolution. In fact, uh, I mean, in fact, uh, enclosure system is one of the very important factors for agrarian revolution. But also, the more agrarian revolution is introduced, the more the enclosure system. So, my dear students, you're going to find something like this, that here we have agrarian uh, revolution, and here we have enclosure system. So if you try to draw, you can draw something like this. This is what sometimes they do in chemistry. You can do something like this. That this one contributes to this and this. So it is just like uh, this one is leading to this one. But the more enclosure system, system continue, it also, it, it also leads to more agrarian revolution. So you can see this is the way we can, uh, we can have this one. But of course, this one has to become uh, enclosure system has to be here. And the agrarian has to come here, but then you are going to draw something like this, you see? So this is what I'm trying to say, my dear students. So with this, of course, you can see that it contributed to development. Uh, you know, it solved the problem of agriculture by allowing the application of science and technology. For instance, we have said, well, it introduced a good crop rotation. You know, it encouraged the people with capital to come to invest, and so on and so forth. So this question also is very simple, my dear students, as you can see it. Another Question, the last one is, show the impact of agricultural revolution to the development of capitalism in Europe. My dear students, we have just finished talk about this, that it encouraged industrialization. Remember, uh, one among the very important reasons for industrial revolution, particularly in Britain as our case study, it was the abundant supply of raw materials. But ask yourself, what sectors producing raw materials, particularly agricultural raw material? It was the agriculture sector. Cotton, for instance, and wool became very important raw materials for the industrialization of Britain, uh, you know, during the second half of 18th century. But also you can see the agriculture sector, as we have said, has contributed also, uh, you know, they became the market for, uh, they became the market for some of the industrial agricultural equipment. So the more agriculture, develop, the more people who are, had invested in industries which produce agriculture implement, including tractors, combined harvesters, planters, and others, and even agrochemical industries, which produce some um, fertilizers, pesticide, and insecticide, those industries were developed. But also you can see some other points, that also this one, uh, you know, uh, that agrarian revolution also has made agriculture sector very, very, uh, you know, very, very profitable and attracted the millions of people to come to invest in agriculture sector and so leading up to the emergence of rural bourgeoisie class, the rural capitalistic class, people with capital. And of course, they got their capital from agriculture and invest in other sectors and so on. So my dear students, this is how you can answer this question. Of course, I know you know many, many points to this question as already discussed. So let's now come to the end of our lesson of today. Our next lesson, my dear students, will be uh, in, uh, we'll continue with this topic of the rise of capitalism and we'll focus on the rise of mercantilism. For now, my dear students, let me just say goodbye. Have a good time. Thank you for listening and watching.